Councillor Osborne. Question number one to the leader, please. Um, Madam Mayor, <coughs> I thank Councillor Osborne for his uh, question. Um, part A is answered by a table showing roughly £800,000 of savings since uh, February this year. On B, yes, there is no single definitive way of measuring the impact of spending decisions on residents' lives. Data that we collect and publish will provide many insights. The regular resident survey and the ones that matters online surveys will also provide insight. It is important to remember that the Council is also making new interventions in the area of, prior <coughs> area of priority, notably in the family recovery, and assumptions should, not, should be, not be made that reduced spending will inevitably lead to deterioration in income outcomes. For example, some changes such as the deletion of administrative rails may have no discernible impact on residents at all. Ultimately, residents will have their own judgment and they will make that judgment in 2014 as they have done for the last 30 odd years. That's Ross Paul. Will the leader join me please in contributing to the ongoing debate on this very subject which is taking place in the online edition of The Guardian, the local government network section of the online edition of The Guardian, this very point that he makes, that there is often a shortage of information measuring the impact of cuts made now, which incidentally might lead to greater costs, greater financial impact further down the line. Will he join me in entering into that debate online? I'm always willing to listen and, and, and take note of what the residents have to say. In fact, all my colleagues from time to time will look at both the, uh, the, the Guardian online as well as the Street Life and other localised websites to see what interests people. But frankly, it is very difficult to make decisions on a crystal ball, ball gazing methodology that Councillor uh, uh, Osborne subscribes to. Councillor Osborne. Leader, please. I thank Councillor Osborne for his question and the, uh, the, the answer to part A is that the long list of open council initiatives is actually council's top line performance measures, not the overall available, not the overall available public data. The executive agrees an annual set of key performance indicators known as top lines, which reflect key local and national priorities. We then sourced comparable data for as many of these indicators as was available to us via government departments and their agencies. The Open Council is the first initiative of its, time, of its type in London and has set, set a high standard for openness and transparency. Its pages have been viewed in excess of 10,000 times since the launch, launch six weeks ago, and residents are encouraged to comment on it. May I say also that of course, it is more transparent than this council has been, and this is, it's more transparent than many other councils have been. So I think, I think it, it, at least uh, Councillor Osborne needs to recognise that we are moving uh, substantially in the right directions. We are keen to make as many of our top line measures as we can available through the open councils. And Councillor Osborne raised this point last time at the last council meeting, and I invited him to make his submission. I've yet to actually get his detailed submission, although I do have a question at this time. Supplementary. Um, regardless of the leader's distinctions about uh, top-line measures, is he aware of the Shelter Housing Data Bank, which, for example, provides publicly available and comparable data on exactly the issues that the opposition has expressed an interest in? And is he aware of the LAPS process, the local authority uh, process which is being run by London councils, um, uh, led by the chief executive of Richmond Borough? Uh, incidentally, he ought to be aware of it because there was an article about Wandsworth in the local government chronicle which mentioned it and uh, presumably would have shown up in the press cuttings, uh, which is doing exactly this process measuring what achievements boroughs in London have, uh, have uh, achieved um, and uh, how they compare one borough to another. I'm aware of both of those. In fact, I'm also aware of uh, the Shelter's Chief Executive's letter to our Chief Executive commending this council 
as being a beacon council in the area of dealing with private landlords. So, you know, it isn't always bad news from Shelter, which is I'm pleased to say. Both, both those databases I'm aware of, and the London Council's database is there for you, everyone to see, including Councillor Osborne and the rest of the public. I don't see why we need to repeat that, although we borrow information from it for our, our open, go, open Council. Councillor Grimston. Yeah, second supplementary. Would the leader agree with me that the problem with Councillor Osborne's approach is that we move back to the days of comprehensive performance assessment, where councils are simply judged on a set of very reductionist uh, uh, performance measures, often against councils who are living in totally different circumstances from Wandsworth, rather than an overall view of what's good for Wandsworth community, which is very difficult to compare with Richmond or indeed any other London borough. I, I would say thank Councillor Gr Grimston for his supplementary. The problem with Councillor Osborne is that Councillor Osborne's looking backwards. The problem with Councillor Osborne is that he wants to count everything but not necessarily value everything. The problem with Councillor Osborne is that he wants to look at it in the way that suits him rather than suits our residents. Uh, Councillor Maxwell Scott. Thank you, Madam. Uh, question number three to the leader. Um, I thank Councillor Maxwell Scott for his question. Uh, yes, our approach has been unchanged since the Conservatives first took control of this council. Put simply, this is to understand that we are spending our residents' hard-earned money, we will, and we will always ensure that every pound works for a benefit. We want our residents to have freedom to spend as much of their money as they fit, see fit. This is one of the reasons for the growing prosperity of Wandsworth, as residents keep more of their own money than, any other, than in any other part of the country. They spend at least some of that money, hard-earned cash, in the borough and generating jobs, generating enterprise, and generating that good feel factor that is so abundant in Wandsworth. Low taxation works for our residents and makes Wandsworth more prosperous. It has been and remains at the, cent the center of the Wandsworth way. For the last four years, Boris Johnson has followed our example and has applied the Wandsworth way. And unlike his predecessors, he has kept the tax low when his predecessor, in fact, increased tax by 28.6% over his term. Supplementary, Madam um, I'd like to thank the leader for his answer. Does he share a very thorough answer as well? It saved me the, the time of reading it. Um, does the leader share my concern um, that the Labour Party's tax-avoiding candidate for London Mayor has pledged to reintroduce the education maintenance allowance, which some people might recall as being sort of dull for kids, uh, but he's not made clear that the cost of doing so would fall directly onto council taxpayers. I thank Councillor Maxwell Scott for his supplementary. Indeed, it was uh, Ken Livingston, uh, as I said, to, to newspaper reporter, borrowing our checkbook, writing a check on our behalf without having the authority to do so. What is even more uh, damnable is that he asked the further education institutes to do the same without actually having consulted them. If he was interested in anything to do with giving young people an opportunity to retain, remain in education, he would have engaged in a more professional manner with local authorities and with the FE, 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 FE institutions in London. I am told not only by Labour leaders in London, uh, Conservative leaders in London, but also by Labour leaders in un London, that this is Ken's way of working. He doesn't consult local authorities, he just announces and expects them to follow suit. Councillor Cooper. Uh, question number four to the leader, thank you. Um, I thank Councillor Cooper for her question. Firstly, I wish to provide clarification at, on at least one aspect of Councillor Cooper's questions. Whilst it is correct that Co Connaught PLC went into liquidation in 2010, this was not as a result of trading activities of the environment services arm of the business that provided services to this council. I do not accept Councillor Cooper's assertion that the council was ever, has ever accepted unrealistically low bids from contractors. Council has well tried and tested procurement procedures which are subject to scrutiny by the procurement advisory team, the relevant overview and scrutiny committees, and the executive, and of course, ultimately also this council. 
The failure of the fountains group of companies, which went into administration at the end of January, has not in any way been linked either to its winning of new council contracts awarded in July last year and in due and due to the commence, due to commence in April this year, or to the trading activities of the five council contracts currently held by that company. During the tendering process, satisfactory financial references were provided by the company. Late last year, the council became aware that the company was experiencing difficulties linked, it is understood, to resi residual debt factors arising from the failure of the Connaught Group and the poor market conditions. During the past year, the Director of Finance has reviewed the process for the ongoing financial vetting of contractors and has put in place arrangements to monitor continuously the financial soundness of its major contractors so that early warning is received on any changes. It is a fact that short-term emergency action taken by the Council to ensure that there has not been a single day's interruption in any of the services covered by the five contracts has resulted in significant additional short-term costs. However, the Council will pursue the administrators of fountains and administration companies to recover as much as possible of the increased costs. Failure of the fountains group of companies affected services contracts awarded by the competitive tendering by local authorities of all political persuasions, including London councils in Camden Tower Hamlets controlled by the party opposite. This borough's residents have experienced good quality, cost-effective services provided by both in-house teams and private contractors, derived from a policy of market testing major service areas. The failure of a contractor once appointed is unfortunate and is thankfully rare. It is not an incident that will deter us from proving, pursuing proven policies that have delivered many tens of millions of pounds in savings and the best value to residents for ones with over the last 30 years. Councillor Cooper. Supplementary. Well, I'm delighted that the uh, leader has been able to, to read his answer to me. Actually, I, I was able to read it for myself. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you very much for the clarification in the first paragraph, which uh, wasn't actually necessary because that wasn't a point that I made in my question. Um, but uh, it, surely the leader is aware that there has been a culture of very tight bidding by a number of contractors. Connaught Fountains are not the only ones who've gone bust in housing circles. Rock is another leading example of the same. Um, so we do find ourselves in danger of this happening again and again. And I wondered if he could just tell us what the cost is going to be. I believe it's nearly a million pounds for this failure. And does he really think that this is a price worth paying? Um, I think Councillor Cooper is a bit touchy about um, being given some clarity in the answer, but never mind. If there was no tight bidding for contracts, I suspect Councillor Cooper would be standing up saying, uh, this bids are a bit too flimsy on there, this bids are a bit too padded on there, are you really getting value for money? So she wants to have it both ways. She wants to be able to say, throw rocks at us should the, contra the bids be padded, as she might say, or if they are tight. The truth of the matter is that over the last 30 plus years, this council has competitively tendered services and provide continual savings for the services that the residents enjoy and at a higher quality than we were previously able to provide. This council pioneered that way of doing things, which is now the norm across the country. I think the councillor Cooper needs to look at this thing in the round rather than the specific. Second supplementary, Madam, Madam Mayor. Councillor Clay. Um, does the leader share with me a slight confusion over how um, Councillor Cooper was thinking at the time when we discussed this contract? I seem to recall that, um, and I'm sure you will too, that she actually voted in favour of the substantial saving that we were making um, by rejigging re the contract. And she, she didn't actually agree with the method of making the savings because she thought that we could economise better by having um, fewer recycling bags deliberated, de um, delivered, and her main worry was about our lack of public consultation about it. Do you think, um, do you recall her making any queries at the time about unrealistically low bids? I'm grateful to Councillor Clay for her supplementary and some further light on uh, Councillor Cooper's attention to detail. 
um, I think the members of the Greater London Authority will be dreading the possibility that she might uh, be bringing to that body her rapier-like attention to detail. More orange bags or less orange bags is not the issue. The issue is about better quality services to our resident at a price they can afford. I am not surprised that after that kind of rapier-like scrutiny, um, Councillor Cooper has forgotten that she was in support of the contract. Councillor Humphreys. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Question five to the leader. I thank Councillor Humphreys for his question. Yes, I have met with London South East Manager of Tesco and they've agreed a number of points which will be of interest to both him and people in Southfields because the Grid Inn has been an issue for, for much of much local concern. What Tesco's are promising is they're, Im they're promising improved appearance to the site in the interim, send a letter to the residents explaining their plans because there is some feeling that nothing is happening and perhaps Tesco's may not come. They will consult with the community once the plans are finalized provide updates on the progress as it happens, involve local residents in the discussions about the fascia treatment and integrating the branding, of the branding in the to, to the existing building, because it is a significant building on, on, on Repplingham Road and has a presence, and it would be a shame if it was not treated with some sensitivity. Willingness to deliver, discuss deliveries and size of lorries, operating hour, opening hours, and a commitment to local jobs and they've also offered to be part of the Southfields village business community and, and talk about uh, uh, lifting up the, the, the brand of Southfields village. Planning permission for this change of use is not required because there's no, such, uh, there's no requirement in planning terms. However, there may be some licensing requirements should Tesco's wish to trade beyond 11 o'clock or sell hot food. Supplementary, Madam Mayor. Uh, I thank the leader for his uh, answer and I, I very much welcome the instigation of dialogue uh, with the company concerned. Um, can the leader just reassure me that that's going to be a, an ongoing dialogue and also reassure the residents of Southfields that um, the purpose of that will be towards making sure that uh, this large corporate, one of the first on our high street, will integrate well with the existing healthy mix of local smaller retailers and the rest of the things that make it such a vibrant shopping street as it is. Thank you. I thank Councillor Humphreys for his supplementary. Uh, that was indeed the undertaking that Tesco's regional manager was able to give. They, they want to be part of the Southfields community. They want to be you know, helping both the residents and the business community. They don't want to be in Southfields just simply for the trading bit of it. Their presence, they feel, is going to be positive for, for Southfields village. I have confidence that their commitment will be delivered and if not, I will certainly ensure that in my regular dialogue with them, I shall be reminding them of, of, of that promise they have made. I certainly also undertake to, uh, uh, to keep the Southfields councillors soon to be joined by Kim Caddy uh, informed of, uh, of the developments on this site. Councillor Carpenter. Uh, second supplementary. I uh, assume that uh, the leader is not going to be stuffing the ballots in Southfields. Uh, but does he share my concern that the national retailers like Tesco's are driving out local retailers from our shopping parades and if so will he do more than uh, wring his hands about it and perhaps use some of the provisions in the localism act to actually encourage local retailers rather than national retailers in these parades. Madam Mayor, I can always rely on Councillor Carpenter to raise the tone of a debate. Um, <laughs> I don't think he has raised it sufficiently for me to answer his supplementary. We'll have to have a look at that because we were doing something else, sorry. The time for questions to the leader is now over. And we will